Coming up on American Black Journal, Wayne State University receives a major grant to expand its work in African-American studies. President Roy Wilson is here to explain. Plus, the Detroit Policy Conference examines the future of downtown Detroit. We're going to hear from two of the guest speakers, Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist and Charity Dean of the Metro Detroit Black Business Alliance. American Black Journal starts right now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm your host, Stephen Henderson. Wayne State University has been awarded a $6 million grant to expand its Black Studies faculty and establish the Detroit Center for Black Studies. The funding comes from the Mellon Foundation and will enable the university to increase its curriculum and research centering on the African-American experience. I got the details from the university's president, Dr. M. Roy Wilson. Dr. Wilson, welcome back to American Black Journal. Oh, good to be here. Yeah. So uh, this is a really exciting development at the Wayne State University. And one of the things I think is really exciting about it is that it, it seems to recognize the importance of uh, Detroit uh, and Detroit's Black history uh, in an economic uh, context, or in an academic context, I should say. Uh, tell me about this grant from Mellon and uh, how it will change Wayne State. Yeah, so there's two parts to the grant. Uh, the first part is, and by the way, in terms of background, it's a $6 million grant from the Mellon Foundation, one of the largest grants that they've given. Um, so there's two parts to the grant. The first part is recruitment of 30 scholars, faculty members, full-time faculty members who are interested in studying um, uh, Black culture, um, uh, African-American uh, history, anything related to the African um, di diaspora. So that's one part of it. And, and on that part, it's uh, it'll be 30 faculty in different stages of development. There'll be 10 who are tenured faculty who will recruit from other institutions. They already have proven themselves. They're typically full professors and they're seasoned uh, investigators. Uh, another 10 would be tenure track, so they're on the way to becoming tenured, but they're a little um, uh, less seasoned in their in their career. And then a third are those who have just finished their postdoc, uh, to train, their doctoral training in uh, either in postdocs or early uh, stages of their career, and we want to nurture them so they become uh, good faculty members, so 30. Then the second part of the um, grant is is something that I think is really, really exciting. And that's the Detroit Center for um, Black Studies, I think is the name of it. Yeah, Detroit Center for Black Studies. And this will be not just Wayne State, it'll be centered here, Wayne State, centered in Detroit, uh, but it'll be a research institute basically for, uh, to bring people, scholars from throughout uh, Michigan universities to be able to do research to uh, on the African di diaspora, as I mentioned, to do community outreach activities, uh, do other uh, activities that connect uh, with the uh, Black experience. And I know that that um, this is uh, the timing of this is uh, somewhat about the funding and 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 the availability uh, of the funding, but it comes at an important time uh, at the university. And um, it, it will have an effect across 
a broad spectrum of the university. I think one of the things that uh, that sometimes uh, is presumed about uh, things like this is that it's just in an African studies uh, department. This is something that affects uh, all of Wayne State. Right. This is going to be our faculty. When we're going to be recruiting faculty throughout the humanities at Wayne State, so in all departments, basically, um, throughout the humanities departments anyway. And um, so they'll come from different perspectives. You know, some of them will be in the uh, African-American uh, studies department. Uh, many of them will not. But the thing that they, they will all have in common is that their aerial scholarship will be in that area, which brings up another point. They don't necessarily have to be African-American. There are scholars who are not African-American who are still interested in that scholarship. And so these will all be people who are interested in that scholarship, which I think is really important that it's centered here in Detroit because Detroit does have um, a population of African-Americans that's uh, about 80%, which I think is larger than any other city in the country. Mm -hmm. And so, and we're centered here in Detroit. Uh, we've been here for 153 years. We've, we have a history of, of promoting diversity and, and, and um, history of bringing in uh, immigrants from all over um, the, the region who uh, have been disenfranchised and and uh, so so we kind of have that social justice um, um, bent anyway and so to marry uh, that with the the funding that allows for us to really scale this in a way that we just would not have been able to do uh, without the funding you know I mean you know, most universities most of the time we're we're, we're um, uh, recruiting, you know, two or three faculty for <laughs> specific areas. Mm -hmm. uh, it's unprecedented to recruit 30 you know, for a specific area. Yeah. Um, uh, talk a little about how the Center for Detroit Center for Black Studies will also connect with the community here in Detroit. As you say, it will connect with other universities, but it's also important that that's here in our city. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, as I mentioned, you know, Detroit is a is a eighty percent African American, so I'm I'm happy that that will be here. Uh, scholars from throughout Michigan, particularly uh, University of Michigan, Michigan uh, State, that in the three campuses of the University of Michigan, uh, Michigan State, Oakland University, uh, various community colleges, uh, will all be able to participate, and um, it, it it'll be a central place for that type of scholarship to be able to be um, uh, supported and uh, nurtured. Um, along with the scholarship, as, as I mentioned, there will be you know, certain activities, whether it's um, uh, community events, uh, activities related to uh, training, uh, activities related to uh, educating the, uh, the wider Detroit uh, community about issues of uh, African-American culture. Um, that be the uh, a centerpiece for that. Yeah. Uh, what's the timetable for for all of this? How soon uh, will people be able to to notice this different uh, this difference at Wayne? Well, we're going to start the recruitment process right away. Um, but this is a, a project that we think would take four to five years before it's before we have all the the. Um, uh, recruitment and before everything is set up the way we want it to be set up. Yeah. Uh, and the other significant thing about the timing, of course, is that this is your last year as president at the at the university. You're going to go off and have a sabbatical and then uh, do some other things. But talk about this as part of the legacy of your leadership at Wayne State. Well, as I mentioned, in in you know when I uh, when I wrote the um, a few uh, words about about my not uh, renewing my contract, I, I mentioned that Wayne State gave me my voice, and what I meant by that is that I care deeply about issues of uh, diversity and inclusion, and Wayne State is unapologetic about that. And one of the last things that we did over the last couple of years is um, really look at. Uh, social justice in a in a, a systemic uh, sense and throughout the university to see what we could do better uh, in terms of social justice, in terms of increasing diversity, in terms of really being more inclusive society. And I think this would be this um, 
uh, ability to uh, uh, scale this African American uh, and African diaspora studies as as an out output uh, of that effort, that uh, social justice uh, effort that we put in is, is kind of like a capstone, I think, to uh, something that we care deeply about as an institution um, and that I care deeply about as an individual, um, but to be able to actually do something and, and hopefully uh, have it be a transformative um, initiative for the institution and for Detroit. The Detroit Regional Chamber held its Detroit Policy Conference last week at the Motor City Casino Hotel. This year's theme was the future of downtown Detroit. Hundreds of civic, business, and community leaders came together to discuss the next phase of the downtown resurgence. I had the opportunity to interview the keynote speaker, Michigan's Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist. Here's a portion of that conversation. You know, Governor Gretchen Whitmer and I are excited about the state of Michigan, what we can do for the next four years. And that always is grounded in what's happening in Detroit. Uh, this, this city is you know, the most important city for our economy, for our culture, and helps to really set the trajectory for our future. And so thinking about downtown Detroit is very personal to me in, in the, my childhood, um, spent the first half of my childhood living just east of downtown um, in Elmwood Park. My father worked downtown, so I remember coming in with him uh, so often, going to the Grand Prix downtown. Super excited to have that going back through the streets of downtown Detroit. Remember going to Trapper's Alley and thinking riding a people mover was the most awesome thing ever to go get off at Trapper's <laughs> it's Alley. It's an amusement park ride for kids. <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> so I, I think how things have evolved, what's become clear is that it's important that every part of our city can advance together. And you can't think of an amazing city, an amazing city of experience, without having an amazing downtown experience. And that experience must then be able to create value for others who live in other parts of the city. And I think we're beginning to really see elements of that take shape. And so the state has been very aggressive in being partners with many of the people in this room, many people who are part of this organization to make sure that those investments are targeted, that we are building on everything from transportation infrastructure with the ongoing investments that the state is committed to in the queue line to amazing uh, event spaces and continuing to support those with the support we've done of Huntington Place to building up the technology ecosystem and the amazing, whether it's incumbent technology companies or startups that are driven by people with ideas, especially in the software space where I come from, mm -hmm. we're excited to see Detroit being named as the number one startup ecosystem for emerging companies and, it, and adding that, yes. <clears throat> adding to the sense that Detroit is the place for a person with an idea to come and thrive and grow it and be successful. That's always been true of our city and if it's true downtown, it can be true everywhere. Detroit is better represented in state leadership than it ever has been. Certainly I'm a Detroiter serving in, as Lieutenant Governor alongside Governor Gretchen Whitmer. House Speaker Joe Tate is a Detroiter. And so the, the city, <clears throat> This is a moment for the city to, to recognize that leadership in Lansing is not only responsive, but that Detroiters are literally in place. Yeah. And so when we're thinking about what our priorities are, they're the same priorities that Governor Whitmer and I have been talking about and making progress on uh, for the last four years. And I think it really starts with how are we laying the foundation for the future in the city of Detroit? The way that we've invested in public education, I believe, is laying a solid groundwork for, for transformational educational experiences. Our administration has worked with a Republican legislature for the last four years to put more money into your schools, into Detroit public schools, the schools that my children attend fourth grade in right now, than ever in the history of education in the state of Michigan. And doing so equitably, positioning young people to realize whatever dreams that they have are available to them in the economy that we are building and growing in the state of Michigan. We are gonna continue to be committed to that educational investment even going a step further by ensuring that kids have access to individualized learning experiences because a lot of kids might need a little bit more support coming out of COVID or just might need people to meet them where they are in a more aggressive way. And we're very excited to be bringing that to reality uh, here in, in, in over the next four years. When you think of other things that, um, uh, that you need to have working, you know, uh, to, to, to make the city thrive, to make Detroiters, 
uh, thrive. You know, education is huge on that list, but also workforce development. And you guys have been doing some work from the state level, uh, augmenting the things that we're already doing locally to, 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 to grow that. That's right. So when I think about skills training and workforce development, let's start with a goal that Governor Whitmer and I set back in 2019, something called 60 by 30. That goal means that by the year 2030, we hope to have at least 60% of Michigan's adults having either a college degree, a community college degree, a professional training or certification, a skill that they have a credential for that can translate into what they can into into work. And we have formed a program called Michigan Reconnect that was passed on a bipartisan basis that provides tuition-free pathways to community college and skills training. And we're excited to say that when we fully funded that program in 2020, we've already made, we started at 45% of Michiganders that, need, that had this kind of credential. We had to make up 15%. Well, just in two years, we made up almost 5% of that gap. We are ahead of schedule and want to continue full steam ahead to get to that credentialed state. Because when we're talking to businesses that are growing in Michigan, that are looking to come to Michigan, the number one question they ask for is can we find enough talented Michiganders? Can we find people who have the skills that we need to grow our business? Your name has been mentioned along lots of others uh, for the soon to be empty Senate seat in, uh, in, in Washington. I wonder what you think about that. I was wondering if he was going to ask me this question. <laughs> I was looking at the clock, making sure I <laughs> left enough time for you to answer that question. I mean, well, so, so where this conversation needs to start is the fact that Michigan has been amazingly served by Senator Debbie Sabinow. Like amazingly served. She has defined the fact that people across the country and the world understand that Michigan is a place where we make and grow things. Um, she has been an example and a mentor to pretty much every public servant currently serving in the state of Michigan, myself included. You know, I got to tell you, you know, we came into this conversation today because I'm excited about the next four years with Governor Gretchen Whitmer and all the work that we can do, all the things that we can deliver. The fact that we have democratic governance for the first time in my life, we have a chance to show that that makes a difference for people in a way that people can therefore think, you know what, this is something that we should continue to support because this is something that is stronger for our communities and for our economy. I didn't expect the senator to announce that she wasn't going to seek re-election. And so this is something certainly that my wife and I are, are, are thinking about because that, that has significant implications on our family. But what's important and what I am focused on is making sure that we can deliver for Michiganders right now using the tools that the voters of Michigan blessed me with in re-electing me as Lieutenant Governor alongside Gretchen Whitmer. And I'm going to do that to the highest and best of my ability. One of the best sessions at the Detroit Policy Conference focused on empowering Black-owned businesses in downtown Detroit. The guest presenter was Charity Dean, who is president of the Metro Detroit Black Business Alliance. Prior to taking the stage, she sat down with Bridge Detroit's Orlando Bailey to talk about closing the racial wealth gap. So you're giving a policy uh, perspective, a, a power perspective today at the policy conference on empowering Black-owned businesses. Can you preview what that's going to look like for us? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about where downtown is now, right? We talk about where we've been 10 years ago. We uh, emerged into bankruptcy, right? The largest city in the United States in municipal bankruptcy, and look at where we are today. We have a tendency, a pattern of actually doing what I think people might say are, is impossible. Mm. And so because of that, what I'm going to do is challenge the audience to continue to do the impossible. I'm going to call out the racial wealth gap that exists in our country, in our state, in our city, in downtown Detroit. Less than 10% of the businesses downtown are black owned and less than 3%, less than 2% of the buildings are black owned downtown wow. in a city that is over 75% black. How do, how do we get there? How does that happen in a city that is over 75% black? How do we get there, right? So this, this story is not unique to Detroit. In fact, we probably have more black owned businesses in downtown Detroit than maybe a downtown Chicago or downtown New York, or Manhattan, right? Um, but the story is the same and it's in every major city across the country and it started when enslaved Africans were brought to this country and then you had decades and generations of discrimination and legal prohibition of black people to acquire land. 
it was literally legal. The federal government prohibited black people from buying land and accessing land. You had restrictive covenants and deeds. My great grandmother, Rosa Malone, integrated a neighborhood in Detroit in 1973 and was the second black family in 1973. Wow. How many generations of wealth have we missed? When we talk about the wealth gap, we talk about capital and land. We didn't get the Fair Housing Act until 1968. Mm -hmm. 1968. Mm -hmm. That's when redlining was prohibited. Mm -hmm. So how did we get here? Oh, I mean, we got here very intentionally. Yeah, right? I want to talk about I want to talk about this capital gap that you were talking about and this wealth gap. And you know, it's 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 less overt now. You know, banks love the word risk. And we know that risk sort of has a color. What are you seeing? What are your members seeing? Um, what we're seeing is that black businesses still do not have access to capital. Um, and I think risk is subjective. Risk has always been subjective. Credit has always been subjective. Uh, we hear stories time and time again of our members that are trying to uh, acquire property for development deals. Uh, for some folks, the risk of uh, is more than the other folks and the only difference is the, the color of their mm -hmm. skin um, and until we have real i mean real transformative reform at the federal level we're always going uh, to be behind what we're trying to do with the metro detroit black business alliance is do what we can within our limited power but the, at the end of the day the problem of racism and the problem of a racial wealth gap should not be on the burdens of black people right yeah. How do we how do we get ourselves out of the tunnel that we did not put ourselves in? Wow. And until the United States government and until corporate America uh, identifies this as a problem for them to solve, we're going to continue to be putting band-aids on. And we're, I mean, we're doing the best. We got the best band-aids possible, but we've got to advocate for policies and we need real policy change mm. um, in order to help close that wealth gap. Well, you know, it's a tall order. And here at the policy conference, you have the corporate community, you have the government community, government community the philanthropic community, all of these folks who have their hands on the levers of power that can change some of the systems of inequities that you are highlighting. How are you feeling about laying bare uh, I some am, of, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to sit on this stage. Yeah. I'm going to stand on the stage and I am going to talk about Black Bottom mm -hmm. and I'm going to talk about the uh, removal of black businesses in a neighborhood and then I'm gonna ask the corporate community to find those descendants of those black businesses and give them land I'm gonna say that today Wow because it's already happening this um, this development yes. this resurfacing of I-375 we literally have the opportunity here's the thing Detroiters do things that other people don't do we hustle hard we do the impossible we have emerged from bankruptcy in a way that no one ever imagined why can't we close the wealth gap? Yeah. Why can't we be first? Mm -hmm. Why can't we be a model for the nation mm -hmm. to say they did it in Detroit? And wait, they did it in downtown Detroit. Look at what happened to Black Bottom and look how they were able to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. up to us. The other interesting thing that the uh, Metro Detroit Black Business Alliance is doing is really shaking and moving in this policy advocacy space in a way that I haven't seen a Black Business Alliance here in the city do in a really, really long time. You're at the city council table, you're in Lansing, you're, you know, you're putting that law degree to work. <laughs> Tell me about why that's important toward the advancement of black-owned businesses here in the city. When we first started the Black Business Alliance, we said our mission was to create programs and advocate for policies. It's been in our mission statement from the very beginning. Why is that important? Um, because you cannot make change without policy. We can do our Capital Connect program and, and train people, but if the rules that exist remain the same, then we're spending a week. And so we've got to create policy change. We have to make sure that the people at the state, local, and, and federal level are thinking about black-owned businesses when they're making decisions. They have to understand the racial wealth gap when they're making decisions. They have to understand how we got here uh, mm. when they're making decisions. And they won't do it if they don't know we're here. Mm. So we are very engaged. You will see we're going to have a whole, we're going to roll out a 2023 policy agenda yeah. um, for black-owned businesses. We view black businesses as one of the ways to help close that racial wealth gap. And it's not just us. Goldman Sachs put out a report saying the same thing. The Kellogg Foundation put out a report saying the same thing. So if we know this, mm -hmm. 
Where's the urgency? Yeah. We're going to bring it. Yeah. So give me a little bit of the origin story. We got about two minutes left of the Metro Detroit Black Business Alliance. I mean, you were a lawyer and a city employee. How does one <laughs> go from being an attorney and a city employee to launching really one of the largest black business alliances we've seen in a very long time? I was created to solve problems. I say I was created to solve problems and when I was at the city of Detroit I was the director of civil rights and I found myself doing a lot of work on behalf of black businesses and not one person not another organization to partner with there were other organizations we would reach out but no one that was really doing the work and so I thought well this doesn't make sense we're convening black business but I'm convening them on the on the behalf of the city and I'm not helping them convene on their own mm -hmm. and so uh, got with a group of other black business owners and um, we said we want to do this. We need to create a space. Black businesses are the lifeblood of the city of Detroit. Mm. They bring jobs. They hire Detroiters. They revitalize commercial, commercial corridors. They need a voice and they need a loud one. Mm. So I'm kind of loud. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org and you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. Take care and we'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bear paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you.